Some market pundits have put the performance we've seen from the S&P 500 this year down to a small concentration of big tech stocks, the so-called Magnificent Seven. But our guest today says if you dig a bit deeper, a different story emerges. Joining us now with more, Ben Gossick, Managing Director and Portfolio Manager with TD Asset Management. Ben, always great to have you here. Always great to have your analysis. So let's take, I know this has been a bit of a uh, be in your bonnet, thorn in your side throughout this year, the Magnificent Seven. It's all about the seven. You've done some di digging here. Uh, tell me what you found. Uh, well, I appreciate our chats. Uh, I look forward to it. Um, yeah, I'd say, you know, I'd say several of the episodes I've been on where we've chatted about stuff, um, that's been something I keep scratching at. Uh, we've talked about market breadth. We've talked about different areas of the market that have been performing. Um, and yet, I still look in my inbox and I see, S&P 7 versus S&P 493, and I still don't understand what's happening, other than narratives can be very strong. We're all busy people, um, and when someone says, you know, if the s and is up 19% and it's driven by seven stocks, and I see the seven stocks are up, I might stop my analysis there because I have more important things to do in my life. But you, like to dig deep, you like yes. to do analysis, you've <laughs> done some analysis right now, and I think from what you were sharing with us before, uh, we can definitely see uh, some gains in the S&P 500 that go beyond just those seven names. Yes, uh, so I decided to count all the stocks in the S&P 500 that have delivered performance better than 19.3%. Oh, so it beat them or beat the broader index. Right, so I, uh, I did my analysis as of last Friday. Uh, so the S&P 500 was up 19.3% year to date, which is amazing, which is more than what people had expected. Um, and I was expecting that I'd start counting the stocks that beat the market and I'd stop at seven. Um, but Craig, I stopped at 132. 132, so it's not just seven. Yeah. So there are 132 stocks year to date that have outperformed the S&P 500. What's also interesting to me is then I did the composition by sector. Um, we have talked about other shows about the strength that we've seen in the industrial sector, even though we're supposed to be in a recession and how that's odd. Uh, we've talked about the strength of home builders, and uh, that's consumer discretionary. And we've thought, well, that's quite odd. I thought rates were so high and no one was buying houses. Um, so why are those stocks outperforming? So of those 132 stocks, um, it should come to no surprise that a good proportion of those winners came from technology. Yeah, there's the, so we got a, a chart now we can show the audience. The big bar is obviously information technology, your seven are in there, but even then it's more than just seven in the infotech. Yeah, so it would be Microsoft and Apple and Nvidia. Um, there are 64 stocks that make up the tech sector in the S&P 500. 36 stocks are outperforming the S&P 500. So you had a 50-50 odds that you know, on January 1st, if you picked one stock out of the tech sector, that you would have outperformed the S&P 500. I'd say those are pretty good odds. Um, but yes, it's not just a select group of stocks. Um, we see outperformance coming from hardware stocks, services, uh, software, and the semis. So it's been broad-based in technology. Um, and the next set of winners, there's 27 stocks that are in the industrial sector that are also outperforming the S&P 500. And we've talked about themes such as the CHIPS Act, um, the Inflation Reduction Act that opened up the, a ton of credits and government incentives for clean energy. So those stocks are benefiting as well. Um, and then the other big bucket came from consumer discretionary. Again, not the typical sectors that you would think would outperform the market when we've been talking about recession all year. Let's get that conversation uh, continuing on recession, right? Because it's been hanging over us and hanging over. She said parts of the market are performing that you wouldn't expect in a recessionary environment. Other parts, I think, if we looked at that uh, chart again, that you would expect to be safe havens if we actually thought we were in a recession or heading into a recession, have not been performing. What's with this recession story? Let's start there. Like, what are we supposed to be thinking as this year is almost behind us? And full disclosure, I don't challenge the recession thesis or the recession fear. And there are many leading indicators that are telling us we're finished a recession, in a recession, still a recession to come. Um, but it's kind of like when we were, in, you know, we were living in caves and we saw an enemy, we would run, and that's how we as a society lived. 
Um, typically, the game plan has been when someone says, hey, there's a recession around the corner, we run mm -hmm. uh, and we hide. And where do we hide in? We hide in fixed income and we hide in consumer staples and we hide in utilities and we hide in REITs. Um, and we avoid certain sort of cyclical dangerous Maybe area. technology stocks, maybe just consumer maybe discretionary stocks, maybe industrial stocks. Maybe industrials, right. Um, and so there was nothing wrong with the thesis of, hey, let's hide out. There is an issue when everyone shares the same thesis. And so the question I keep raising is, what do you win um, when you're the most bearish person in a room of bears? Um, and the only answer I get is, if you're an economist, you go on a book tour. Um, <laughs> But if in, in the game of, and, of investing, um, typically that's why people say, oh, let's be contrarian. But I'm not trying to be contrarian for the sake of con being contrarian. It's just more of like the, looking at the areas that are outperforming and then starting to ask more questions like, why is this happening? Uh, and it goes back to another episode that we uh, I know we did where we started talking about the market making a bottom last year in, in the summer. Um, but if you looked at everything on a market cap perspective, that, that was getting distorted and you had to look at things more on an equal weight perspective to see that. Um, so it just, again, I, I don't think we can fight narratives, um, but I think we as investors, uh, as stewards of capital, it's our job to question narratives uh, and then look to the facts and the data to, sort of to back it up. And a lot of times that creates an opportunity. Let's talk about that, right? I mean, I, I know also that sometimes uh, you have a problem with this arbitrary definition of when we should be gauging our success as investors, that, you know, we've made another trip around the sun, boom, it's January 1st. But, you know, some of us think that way. The year is drawing to a close. We're almost into December. With everything that's happened so, so far this year and defying expectations, do we take anything from that into 2024? Yes, do not forecast. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I know we're getting to the end of the year. Um, I'm already starting to see people's projections. You know, this financial institution thinks the S&P is going to be at, you know, 5,000 at the end of next year. I just encourage people, like, that's interesting. That's kind of what we want to hear. Um, but if you followed the forecast for last year, which was um, earnings cratering, which they didn't, equities following and cratering, which they didn't, um, yields collapsing, which they didn't, um, the most important thing is that you follow your process. And for us, it's always been about secular trends. These trends can last three years, five years, and then we can avoid um, the sort of um, demands in terms of like, tell me what's gonna happen in three months or six months. Um, I'm trying to learn how to play golf, Greg. And what I've learned is you can't start thinking of like the next holes until you finish the first hole that you're on. Uh, and that's what I like to do when I apply that to investing. 